Hi, everybody. Um, to people I don't know, and those who don't recognise me because I had a third baby and stopped shaving. Um, <coughs> okay, so uh, you've already heard from Ted and in um, somewhat extraordinary detail from Will <laughs> about this new data set of pressure events that we're adding to every single match. And um, I hope you're excited. I'm excited to see what analysis that we at StatsBomb can come up with in the next few months. Um, on all these off-the-ball pressure events, and hopefully some of you in the audience will too. But what I'd like to do now is turn those pressure events on their head and look at actions under pressure. How do these pressure events affect the player being pressured and what they choose to do and how they're able to do it? So when we record a pressure event, it always has the player doing the pressing, always has the time stamp and, and position, but we also always measure a duration. And this is the period for which the pressing player is tracking the player with the ball, or either standing and blocking a passing angle or closing them down. Um, and multiple players can be doing that. Um, but then within this duration, within this window, every action that the player on the ball takes is then marked down as under pressure. And you'll see that in the data. Um, <clears throat> And it's these, it's these events that I'm going to talk about um, right now. This is a very prototype-y visual that you can get from StatsBomb IQ. If you want a demo of this, then track down this man and insist that he shows you. But basically, this shows you the dots are, are just pressure events. The arrows are all actions being pressured, be they passes or shots. Um, and you can see that you can begin to tease out the, direct, the direction that the pressure is coming from, and you can look at things like the length and the intensity. If you keep chasing the player, we'll give you multiple pressure events, so you can actually build a vector um, of how you move towards that player. Okay, let me show you a couple of uh, examples. I know you want to see numbers, but I'm going to subject you to some boring football. Um, so first up, this is, this is an example of some passes being um, played under pressure. First up here, we've got Robertson coming along the wing, and you'll see in the data, this is two players pressing this pass, not particularly intensely, um, and you'll see that from the distance, and um, he makes the pass into the centre. Now, at this point, it's probably worth pointing out, we've already mentioned that we track separately ball receipt events. Um, not only because we want to be able to easily identify the player receiving every single pass, um, we also try and record that data for incomplete passes. So if we think it's very, very clear where the pass was aimed, then we will put that ball receipt event in so that you can kind of track what the intent was, even if it went out, even if it got intercepted. But the great thing about having the separate ball receipt events is that we can now tell you which players are receiving the ball under pressure, who has less space, who has less time to maybe control the ball and then make an onward pass. And so what you would see in the data here is um, two, perhaps even three players um, pressuring this ball receipt and then the subsequent pass. So we've got three events in a row under pressure um, and those are passes. Let me not show you that again. Um, and let me give you an example of the sort of shot under pressure. So we're coming from the right, and John Stones gives Firmino a little hello, welcome to the box around here. Um, and Firmino, if it's a shot, it's not particularly on target. This is very different from the pressures that you saw um, pressuring a pass. This isn't John Stones trying to block off an angle. This isn't John Stones really playing for the ball at all. Um, this is John Stones using his physicality and his proximity to Firmino to actually undermine the execution of the shot. Um, and so, in a way, that's two different types of pressure, but they share a common theme, which is you as a player being pressed have to take into account this player that is pressing you. So either you are going to make a different choice because of them, because passing angles have been cut down, so you've only got one escape route, or the actual event itself, the shot, the pass, is going to be pressured and therefore your execution is much more difficult. So, I'll walk through this, is a little bit complicated. We've got about 120 events every game marked as under pressure. Um, 
you can see the blue bars here are basically the overall volume of events, as you would expect. Um, passes and ball receipts massively dominate everything else. There's a slightly lower number of ball receipts than passes, because obviously we can't always confidently state who the pass was aimed at. Um, and on the right, you see the proportion of these events that were played under pressure. Now, by, by raw count, obviously, again, passes and ball receipts are the most common. But the highest ratio is miscontrol. Miscontrol is a simple event. It's just when the ball bubbles away from you. You're not necessarily being tackled, but you lose it. And that happening under pressure isn't particularly confusing. Um, dribbles under pressure, just to explain, when we mark a dribble as under pressure, it's because the pressing player, the defender, is initiating the need for a take on, as opposed to the attacker moving at speed and taking them on actively. Um, so we make a little bit of a, a determination there. So it's 120 um, events every game, and each one is warped and changed by the presence of pressure. So these are what we're going to look at today. This is, um, this is how actions under pressure break down by position. It's pretty similar to the, to the graphs that Will has shown, but as you would expect, wide players, especially fullbacks, receive a ton of pressure and have to make all of their passes under pressure, um, as well as wingers, and also deep players, so DMs and again, fullbacks, and that's partly because um, deeper turnovers are much more valuable. But it, it makes sense that it's the wide players because obviously half the pitch is already shut off by the sideline, and so um, half your job for pressing that player is already done. So that's how it breaks down by position. Now, one of the things that we can do with actions under pressure is we can look at potential weak links in teams. Um, and we can also look at how certain players are subjected to more pressure than others. Now, this is Liverpool. And what you'll immediately see is that the percentage of passes that Trent Alexander-Arnold has to play under pressure is 15%. So he sits there at the top. He's making a decent number of passes uh, per game in the small sample that we have, but 15% of them are under pressure. Now, you sort of expect that. He's playing it right back, and we already know that fullbacks are kind of overwhelmingly targeted compared to other um, positions. But also, it's kind of a cliche, it's kind of an opposition analysis cliche that there's a young kid playing fullback. That's the guy that you want to try and panic, try and close into a mistake, maybe force a turnover. Um, and... Yeah, I mean, you'll also see that players at the top are kind of forwards who you would expect to be playing most of their actions under pressure because they're in a much more intensely defended part of the, part of the pitch. So um, let's have a look at if it's, whether we think it's a valid choice to pressure Trent Alexander-Arnold because we know he's been doing pretty well in the game so far. Um, this is past completion um, for events under pressure for all of these players in the Liverpool squad. Now at the top, you can see Firmino, again, we can forgive Firmino for not completing 30% of his passes. He only completes 70%, but again, he's in a very dangerous part of the pitch. He's in the attacking third, under a lot of pressure from more defenders. So we're not surprised that he's at the top there. Maybe slightly worrying is Loris Karius, misplacing 30% of his passes under pressure. When you chase Karius, then three times out of 10, he's going to misplace a pass. Now, that doesn't compare well to Aderson at 13%, but again, you're probably going to forgive him because a lot of those passes are just going to be whacked up front and not high-value turnovers necessarily. Um, but then if we look at Trent Alexander-Arnold, who comes in third place, 28% of his passes are wayward, which doesn't compare favourably to Robertson, who only misplaces 17%. So it's possible that just looking at pass completion that there is actually a decent choice here, that the young fullback pressured under his actions is actually a good choice. Now, most of you in this room are thinking I'm an idiot now because pass completion is a kind of terrible stat to look at because the context really matters of exactly where the pass is, exactly what happened in the passage of play building up to it. And um, we, have a, we have a passing completion model at StatsBomb that tried to account for some of this. So instead of just raw passing percentages, we look at things like 
what zone the part is coming from, what's it coming to, some of the contextual information. And we were really, really excited about adding in these pressure events because we thought it would give us um, a ton more signal about how hard the pass was that you were taking. And um, it quickly became clear to us that actually that signal wasn't necessarily there. There's less than 1% difference in overall completion rate between passes that are under pressure and passes that are not. And the reason for that is actually very simple when you think about it. Because when you are under pressure, you make different choices. You don't just find it harder to make the pass that you were going to make. You don't see the guy in front of you pressing the passing lane and think, well, I'm just going to not make you from 12 yards. You actually change your mind. You turn, you find another option. And um, so it's very important to note that pressure changes the game, not just in a way that makes it harder for you to perform what you wanted to do, but it actually changes your decision-making process. So we need to look at something beyond just past completion. And um, I've tried to profile this for a few players. So these, these are similar to Will's. This is um, two radars overlaid on each other. Blue is the passing directions that each player chooses without pressure. And red is the passing directions that that player chooses with pressure. Now, you can see we've got two pretty bold players here. If you press Cesc Fabregas, then that's absolutely fantastic for him. He has just been waiting for you to get closer. He has um, a massive amount of tools in his repertoire to just pass it past you, move the ball forwards. So you can see that there's this big spike of passes under pressure forwards. And he's actually, in the data set, we don't have the most Chelsea games at the moment, but in the data set, he's the one that kind of changes the most, kind of beats his man the most with just his passing. And the same goes with uh, Kevin De Bruyne. Um, you can kind of see this side-to-side -side tendency, not under pressure, so some tiki-taka going on there, but you press him and Man City's positional play and Kevin De Bruyne's passing talent means that he is going to find a forward option. He's going to push it forwards, he's going to push it out to the wings. Um, he doesn't care if you're pressing him. It, it, in a way, he, that's a way for him to beat a man and actually move the ball forwards. So both of these players pretty heroic under pressure. Let's have a look at a couple of players whose who's passing really changes. So look at these cowards. Um, Moussa Dembele. Now he's a pretty normal range of passing when he's not under pressure. But the moment he gets pressured, all of the forward passes drop away. Very, very, very safe play. Just stroking it out wide, stroking it back. Um, he is not going to try and beat you with his passing. And the same goes for Kante. We, uh, we don't really think of Kante as a passing player, and we expect him to be conservative. And so when he's under pressure, he'll just take the simple option, passing sideways. If he's lucky, he finds Sesk, ball goes up the field again. Now, anyone who has watched Moussa Dembele or Tottenham recently knows that this is horribly unfair, because you press Moussa Dembele, and fine, he doesn't pass past you, but that doesn't mean that you can't jink to the side, dribble, drive the ball 20 yards up the field. You've all seen it happen. So when looking at these actions under pressure, it's really, really important to look beyond just the context of a single, a single action being executed. You've got to think about how the decision-making changes, but you've also got to think about what happens subsequently. How does the team work together to beat the press? What's the actual holistic view? So what I've tried to do to capture uh, Moussa Dembele's inability to pass past pressure, but what we know in our heads to be a great ability to actually beat the pressure is build this slightly complicated squiggle. Um, so what this is, is the path of the ball on average in the 10 seconds after you press Dembele. So you'll see, um, this is zero seconds. So somebody's trying to press him. And you can see this little jink back into the left. We captured that in the passing chart, but maybe that's, that's also just a carry of the ball. That's also a dribble. But then you can really clearly see the drive forward. So when we average every single passage of play after Moussa Dembele is pressured, there's a clear trend forward. You can see that we've moved up the pitch 20 yards here, maybe over to the side a little bit. But it's clear that this is a trap that Tottenham work on. Moussa Dembele will receive the ball from the full back in the middle, draw you on, and then 10 seconds later, the ball's 20 yards up the pitch. It's a 
Try. Same for Liverpool's fullbacks. So on the right, we've got Alexander Arnold, on the left, we've got Robertson. Um, at zero, this is where Alexander Arnold is pressured. And then on average, you can see there's not really a forward trend here. I mean, five yards isn't much, but there's clearly a trend infield. And so when you press Alexander Arnold, pretty much the same with Robertson, you know that the ball is going to travel infield. They're probably not going to beat you up the line. They're probably not going to pass up the line for dribble. Um, you know the ball's going to come infield. And in a way, you can use this information to build more complete, more holistic pressing traps and also just study the passage of the ball after um, pressure. So hopefully you see that in this way, it's not just single actions under pressure, it's actual coordinated passages of play that you have to study to be able to understand how a team does or doesn't beat the press. Now, one of the interesting things when you get um, a new attribute like this, this under pressure attribute that we're adding to events, is that it becomes meaningful when it's not there. So we've got 120 actions under pressure every single game, but we've also got hundreds that aren't under pressure. And I tried to look at whether it was meaningful that some players make more or fewer passes without pressure. And so what I've collected is, um, this is basically passes made or received in the final third that moved closer to the goal. So any sort of ball progression with passing. And this shows the percentage of those that each of these players took under pressure. And my idea here is that we might start to be able to identify a player's sort of positional sense. Are they getting in positions to receive the ball where they're not immediately pressured, where they're not under pressure at the moment they receive the ball, they're not under pressure when they then make the next forward pass? And I quite like this list. We've got Deli Alley. We've got David Silva. We know there's a, there's a few Man City players here. We know that there are team effects coupled with the individual talent level, that they have great positional sense, but they also have the structure and the spacing within the team to make that space. And what I also like is there's, there's players like Mesut Ozil, who is often maligned for sort of lacking intensity, for walking during games. But I think what this shows is because of his intelligence on the pitch, because of his positioning, he's actually able to just find the right position to be in. He doesn't have to sprint to catch up with the game. He's already ahead of you, he's already in space, and he knows where he's going to put the ball afterwards to put you in space. And so I quite like that we catch a mess at Ozil there. There's a few names to, to chase up here. We've got Johan Berg, Goodmanson. It's worth looking at. Um, and I thought it's probably interesting the flip side of this is just a bit of fun. These are potentially, if we believe that we are measuring good positional sense, these are the worst positioning players. So these are the ones who are always receiving the ball under pressure. They're always making forward passes or attempting forward passes and they find themselves under pressure. Now some of this is team effect. Um, Robbie Brady breaking from that really, really deep block. Um, I think you would expect him to be pressured a lot of time. But again, we're seeing Trent Alexander-Arnold suffering whenever he tries to move the ball forwards in an attack. So he's, a, he's targeted not just in defence but in attack as well. And again, there's a lot of fullbacks here, which is kind of what you'd expect. Um, and so these are, these are players who are always pressured. Perhaps they're slightly worse at finding space, or perhaps they work at, they're playing for teams who are slightly worse at creating those sorts of uh, structures that include a lot of space. So, just to conclude, um, actions under pressure teach us new things about existing events. They teach us context, they teach us about the decisions that underlie them, and extra context for the execution of them. Um, I think it's a really, really valuable approach to look at the weak links within teams, even if you're relying on the work of others, because you can see what every other team in the Premier League thinks about uh, pressing opposition players. And also I think there's a lot of interesting work to look at for, for players and teams who are able to build possessions without pressure or take individual actions in certain parts of the um, pitch without pressure. Thank you.